Welcome to a state-of-the-art uh, discussion uh, tonight. Um, as introduced, Scott is a very uh, special person, extremely bright, full of humor, and always challenging in his uh, thinking. And by virtue of background, uh, although many of you know him, uh, you may not know the fact that he's worked at uh, some very impressive uh, places, starting with uh, an education in computer science uh, uh, at Stanford. He then moved to Xerox PARC, Microsoft, Dext, uh, Santa Cruz Operations, and Philips, where his last uh, job was uh, to be the CEO of the semiconductor uh, group there. And so since 2005, uh, he joined uh, Broadcom, and Broadcom has fared just extraordinarily well uh, since then. And there are probably many uh, reasons for that. One of the reasons is he's actually a wine connoisseur, but I'm, I'm uh, educated that he's also a very frugal buyer, and many of you will recognize that, uh, that trait. I'm Scottish. <laughs> Scottish, yes, yes. Well, uh, let's not forget I'm Dutch. And so, uh, uh, you know what it's like if, if a Scot and a Dutch discover a penny simultaneously, you know what they get. Right? Copper wire. A mile of copper wire. And uh, most of it will be on Scott's side. So, <laughs> And there's another reason why we both have a glass of wine. We were, of course, educated by Ben Niles half an hour ago. And so um, the, the one thing I didn't tell you, though, about Scott's background is that his undergraduate was in psychology. And, and what better background than to start by putting the semiconductor industry on the couch for a minute <laughs> and say, you know, based on everything we've heard, you know, how is this, are we still call it an adolescent industry uh, uh, doing, or, or are we sort of in deep depression here? You know, what, what's the diagnosis? Well, after uh, Dan Niles' talk, I think it's deep depression. But I, <laughs> Gosh, Dr. Doom. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it's not a single individual. The semiconductor industry is a, a group of individuals. There are adolescents, there are infants, and there are a few senile people too. And so I think uh, the, the industry as a, as a whole will evolve and, and go through that whole life cycle. Yeah, so, and that evolution obviously right now appears to be extremely fast, right? It was interesting listening to, uh, especially the last session, because this was a representation of the smaller and the upcoming uh, companies, and you can clearly feel this, so where is this going? Mm -hmm. And there was clearly this hope of Broadcom, call me please. <laughs> You've called on a lot of companies. Uh, I understand we, we shouldn't talk about the latest acquisition because it's somewhat embargoed in communication, but you're doing two to three a quarter or so? One or, one or two a quarter. Uh, one or two a quarter. We're buying uh, new companies. And, you know, our goal is, is to focus on getting the best talent and best teams we can. And we hire as many as we can organically. And when we run out of money doing that, we look to uh, acquisitions to do that even faster. But, you know, it's easier said than done. Why would you do acquisitions at all? You have a really good team yourself. We would love to think that all of the best innovations come from Broadcom, but the reality is they don't. Uh, startup companies often do tremendous work and, and they put great teams together. So for us, acquisitions are a way to do two things. One is to acquire great new technology uh, and, and great teams, but also to keep us young uh, as a company and keep us moving quickly. And we like to think of Broadcom as a, a, a sort of a flotilla of startups. We're too big to be a startup anymore. Do you retain the, the principles? Uh, we retain most of the uh, people we acquire. In fact, if you look over the last five years, we've probably retained probably 85, 90% of all the people in the companies we've acquired over the last five years. So pretty good retention rates. So, so, so the thing that, that always puzzled me is, you know, and we've done, I don't know, 60 or so acquisitions over the years, is, is the problem of the premium. Mm -hmm. Because you, know, you deal with companies that uh, you know entrepreneurs and they're gonna put together a great team and a great culture and so on. And then comes the moment of selling the company and it's all out on price and you're sitting on the other side and you know that every dollar means so many more people that are gonna be laid off. And by the way, oh, uh, three months before being acquired, the principal put in place changing control. We get them to waive all that stuff. You get them to <laughs> waive the stuff. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, when you do a negotiation with a company, it's always, it has to be a win-win for both sides. I mean, again, if, you, if you're buying the company and you intend to get rid of all the people, then you don't care what the of terms course. and conditions are. Yeah. But when we buy a company, we intend to keep the people, and that's the asset we're really buying. And so for us, it's, it's absolutely important to do a structure such that it makes sense to Wall Street, it's financially, uh, fiscally appropriate, but on the other hand, it incents the team that we acquire to be excited coming into Broadcom and to feel that they have a great opportunity going forward. And you've got to find the right balance. You say keep the people, but at the same time, uh, you're probably the first one to say, hey, there's a consolidation going on in the market. Consolidation, invariably, as we heard from another speaker, is driven by the need for scale. 
because at the end of the day, we're investing a boatload of, of money, some in capital, uh, the case of Sandisk. Uh, our companies tend to be more on the, uh, on the P&L side. And scale matters, right? And so, so is in a downturn consolidation not really a, an efficiency driver for an industry? Well, scale matters, but I've seen a lot of companies argue that scale matters as an excuse to have too many people. Okay, and, and so scale matters, but also fewer, smarter people is important also. Okay, so if you can do what other companies do with fewer people, smarter people, and do it more efficiently, that's better than just having a lot of people. Okay, so, so I, I'm not sure that scale matters. I think that's usually used as an excuse to have in, uh, you know, bloated infrastructure and too many people. So, so uh, another form of scale is, is really uh, systemic scale in terms of globalization scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is your perspective of uh, you know, being in different locations? Where, where are you guys today? How broad? Uh, what so, is so Broadcom, we've, because we've acquired a lot of companies and we've looked for teams around the world, Broadcom has over 50 development sites around the world um, in probably half that many countries. And we have said that instead of what some companies do, which is you centralize all the resources into one place, which obviously is the most efficient if you can do it, we would love to believe that all the smartest people on the planet you know, want to live in Silicon Valley or Orange County, uh, but they don't. Okay? There are people who want to live in Athens, Greece. There are people who want to live in Israel. There are people who want to live in, in Colorado or Austin or Canada or wherever. And so we have said that one of the core competences we will create at Broadcom is to be good at working with development sites around the world and figure out how to turn that into an advantage rather than a disadvantage. Um, there is a disadvantage in that you need to invest in communications. So we have high-speed links between all our sites and we buy a lot of airplane tickets. United Airlines are very good suppliers of us and some of the other airlines. And you know, I, I see Neil here. I mean, a lot of us spend a lot of time flying as a result. But well, Neil we, flies a lot more than you do, he, he does. what I hear. He does, actually. <laughs> Yeah. But one of the things we try to do is if you get multiple teams working on a chip, we have examples of chips that might have more than a dozen teams all contributing IP from different startups we've acquired or from Broadcom uh, longtime teams. And what we'll do is we'll have them work on different pieces. We'll have them work around the clock. And we've turned that into an asset rather than, you know, the liability some companies might see it that, you know, oh, my God, we're so distributed around the world. That's a problem. So, you know, while we don't look to create lots of new sites, we welcome getting great teams, um, and it's okay if they're in a different site. We make that work. Uh, now, for a while, obviously, there was a massive push to go global, A, for cost reasons, then to be close to the customers. Uh, the cost reasons appear to be changing at a pretty uh, rapid clip right now. What's your experience in the emerging uh, industries, in the emerging countries in terms of compensation, what's happening right now? in light of, meanwhile, the West being under a lot of pressure. So we've watched a lot of competitors, you know, hire huge teams in low-cost countries and, and fail. And I think in our industry, if you look at the cost of people, the difference between somebody in a low-cost region, whether it's, you know, Bangalore or Hyderabad or China or whatever, is not the same difference you would see in other industries. If you're running a call center, okay, it's dominated solely by what you pay the individual uh, in salary. So in the United States, you might pay them 30 grand, okay, you might pay them, you know, a thousand dollars in another country. That's a huge swing. In our industry, when you look at all the costs of those really exorbitantly expensive EDA tools, okay, <laughs> that you have to layer on the, the cost See, this, of This the, is the copper wire thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can feel it going. <laughs> But, but, but when you layer on the cost of the tools, and it's not just exorbitant EDA tools, it's exorbitant processors. And I mean, engineers are really good using computing resources, okay? And I don't know if you guys have checked, but when you get in these smaller nodes, okay, the computing resources to run all the exorbitant EDA tools just goes up exponentially. And so the cost of an engineer, about half of the total cost of an engineer in our organization is tools and infrastructure. And you don't get any savings if you put that in another country. So maybe if you pay them nothing in the low-cost country versus what you pay them in the United States, you get a 50% savings. And so we believe that the very best engineers can produce 10 times an average engineer that totally swamps any cost savings you would get by moving them to a, quote, low-cost country. So we hire the best people we can find, and we don't focus so much on on you know, what are low-cost countries and high-cost countries. Obviously, if you have the best engineer you can find in low-cost versus high-cost country, go for the low-cost one. 
but it's not like many of the other industries that have that 30 to 1 savings. For us, it's more a 2 to 1 savings. Yeah, and I think there's no question that high tech is probably one of the best examples of a true meritocracy, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are, where you mm -hmm. come from, gender, et cetera. Uh, diversity is good but it is ultimately what can you do, and there are very, very big differences in terms of capabilities between the engineers. The, the other thing, I think if you can get along with smaller teams, you're better off with hiring really good small teams than large teams of average people, because I believe that productivity in a team is roughly the logarithm of the number of people in the team. Mm. Okay, and so as the team gets larger and larger and larger, the productivity does not go up at a linear level with the number of people in the group because of all the communication and having to partition the tasks uh, and, and whatnot. And so you're, you're better off if you can figure out how to do it with small teams that are highly focused and have a clear charter for what they're doing. You'll get better productivity for the same quantity of total people. Just connecting back for just a second to the, the, this question of how can startups prepare themselves better to be acquired, given that we just saw the statistics of roughly two-thirds being acquired versus maybe at best one-third going IPO. And, and just literally five minutes ago uh, around the, the cocktail, you said something super interesting regarding the, the notion of international companies versus domestic. Go there again. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. You may have read about this in the Wall Street Journal. A lot of companies like us and many of our peers uh, generate a fair amount of cash overseas. How, how, how much of the cash is overseas versus here today? So uh, we have most of our cash onshore, but uh, we generate most of our cash offshore. And, and many of our peers also generate a fair amount of cash offshore. If you bring the cash onshore, you pay U.S. taxes you know, to do that, and, and that's all well and good. But you, know, you don't want to do that unless you, know, you really need to spend the money over here. When we buy a company, if it's a U.S. company, we pay for the company with U.S. cash. Sometimes it means we need to repatriate cash to do that. What we see is Which that costs you 35 percent in tax. Or whatever the company's tax rate is. Ours is a little lower. Ours is a little lower than that. Well, yeah, it's run by um, a Scot, guys. Uh, but <laughs> yours is 35 percent? Oh, well, for repatriation. For repatriation. <laughs> <laughs> But, but one of the things I think you want to think about is that a lot of companies, and I thought this was an amazing statistic from the panel just, just before, and they, what was it, 95% of the exits are M&A exits, and yet everybody's setting up their corporate structure in shells for an IPO. Okay? We would probably pay 10 or 20% more for a company that was a foreign company and we could use our foreign cash. Okay, because we don't have to repatriate the cash. And I bet a lot of our peers would do the same thing. So why would you set up a company for a U.S. company so we have to use the expensive, hard-to-get cash as opposed to the foreign cash? So those of you who are thinking of starting a company or are starting a company, I mean, maybe you're here in the U.S. and the only way to do it is a, is, is a U.S. company. But just think about it. If you are a foreign company or starting up overseas, don't feel like you have to create a U.S. shell on it. You might be destroying value doing that. And if you're going to go IPO, you can do that later. You can set it up as a foreign shell or as a U.S. shell later. But don't do that. That, that will cost you value.